thanks everybody for being a part of this. It's really exciting that we have tools to uh, really open up the office and to be really, really transparent about the work that we do here. I, I do want to make sure we all clarify that along the way, I may do a little educating of myself, uh, of everyone else, because there's so much misunderstanding between the role of our office uh, and local school districts. This is a state that is relentlessly focused on locally elected school boards and superintendents uh, making tough decisions. And in this environment we're in, they're still doing that. Um, the governor is the one with authority to close schools and all that. Um, I do not have that authority uh, one way or the other. So uh, I look forward to the conversation, really talking education, kind of what guidance we've given and what direction we've given and what the expectations are of districts. And when it's really very much about a local school district uh, decision making, I'll point you there. I'll say this is where you really want to talk to your local district about that. So looking forward to it and thank you. Thanks for making the time. Uh, once again, we have him until about 12.15. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and just open it up. Questions, if you have a question, just raise your hand and then I'll unmute. Just go ahead, turn on your camera first so we can see you. Everybody turn on your camera. And if you have a question for Chris, just go like this and I'll be able to see you on your camera and then I'll unmute you. You can go ahead and ask your question. I believe Erica, you had been waving your hand earlier. Let me go ahead and uh, just, unmuted you. Erica, whenever you're ready, go ahead and ask your question of Chris. Okay, I have a question, but I'm not sure if it's going to be an answerable question based on the rules. Um, I'm in Pierce County in a smaller county or in a smaller city in Pierce County, where the recommendations of you um, have become requirements. Um, so I was just curious, um, since Pierce County is now required to follow those recommendations, um, what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, thank you, Erica. I'm really glad you opened this question because um, our, our guidance, of course, in the governor's directive is that local districts are deciding um, when to open and how, but within a health framework. So there's high risk, medium and low risk counties based on uh, how many COVID cases there are per 100,000 of the population over a 14 day period of time. Pierce County is the only county in the state with a local health official, um, and it is within his legal rights has ordered all public and private schools to start remotely. Uh, he, that is the only county that's done that. Everywhere else, they are following the governor's directive in terms of the flexibility. They're making that decision locally. Most are starting remote, but they understand it's their local choice at the school district level. Uh, Pierce County is the one place where we see that local health authority exercising their statutory rights and making a broad uh, proclamation for all of the county. Uh, so again, it is within his rights. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating for some folks, I think. And uh, what we were trying to do here at the state is recognize that very small rural and remote districts will have a different opportunity than very urban districts with high population densities and, and perhaps higher risk factors. The governor and I were trying to create a little more flexibility around that. Um, that, that is not the scenario right now in Pierce County. So I really appreciate you elevating that. All right, who else has a question? Er and let me see, Erica, did you have a follow-up about that? I do. I just wanted to follow up. Um, I just wanted to, I think that the goal, and I, I really appreciate you um, advocating for the, the decisions to be left up to um, like headmasters of private schools or school districts, because um, I believe even in Pierce County, there are a lot of the variations in sizes of cities. Um, I myself am from Gig Harbor. And so it's a, it is a city that's on the only, the only city on the side of the bridge that's, you know, kind of closer to Kitsap County and we're kind of a city outside of Pierce County. So um, I think it would be helpful to reiterate maybe that the overall goal, if it is to get the most kids in school as possible based on very local um, community transmission. So I appreciate you um, advocating for the um, right to be left up to the school district and the headmasters of private schools. And, and Erica, are you a parent? I am a parent, yeah. And do you want to see your kids back in a school building? Yes, I do, because our school is a small school and, um, you know, we're really functioning a lot closer to the available childcare options for our families. And we have updated our HVAC system. We've purchased machines to take um, video or uh, take the kids' temperatures. It documents that they have a mask on. We have social distancing. Our faculty and staff are happy to come back and be in the classroom. Um, we have cleaning protocols. We hired a nurse. Um, we have a quarantine area for someone who, who may 
get COVID and we have procedures in place. We spent all summer, our school has worked all summer tirelessly um, to develop a plan based on the recommendations of um, OSPI, the CDC and the Department of Health. And um, we really feel like the decision was taken out of our hands to provide a really safe environment for kids um, to learn, to be educated. And um, many of our families will now have to seek childcare, which is deemed essential. Um, but because school is not specifically deemed essential in the governor's Safe Start plan, um, Dr. Chen has said that we cannot um, we cannot open. So it's it's a little um, hard to understand right now. Chris, you want to clarify that? I mean, school is essential, but having kids in class. Um, there are recommendations that the state has laid out. Let's just go right to that. You know, smaller uh, districts that feel like they can better control the spread of COVID. What is your recommendation to those districts uh, from the state? Yeah, so again, the governor has this authority and what he has determined is that uh, his Department of Health has identified three categorical rankings for counties, high, medium, and low risk based on uh, the prevalence of the virus per 100,000 of population. And within that, high risk of very little, uh, if any, uh, contact with students face-to-face, -face. medium risk, some more opportunities, uh, a real want to think about early learners in particular, and of course, low risk, uh, really a, an opportunity to be more uh, expansive and open. But ultimately, it's a framework for local school districts and local health officials to be guided by, and, and folks are following that. They're really being consistent about that. And that same flexibility locally is offered to public and private schools. Um, it is Pierce County where the local health official has said, uh, notwithstanding the state's ability to let this be a local school board or private school decision, countywide that official has closed schools there uh, to in-person learning to start the year. Uh, it is, we understand, within his legal authority to do that. Again, only the governor, a local health official, or a school district can force a closure, uh, not our office for sure. Um, and so it's one of those complicated situations that Eric is describing where uh, they were particularly following one of the most robust health frameworks in the country that we put together, um, but a local health official has decided uh, that he thinks there's still too much risk and has made this other declaration. Again, um, I, I respect the legal authority that he has. I just think it's complicated uh, given the fact that the state built a statewide framework of local decision making. Um, and so very challenging in Pierce County right now, as Erica described. Erica, thank you so much for your question. Once again, everybody and Jim, I'm coming to you next. Um, turn your camera on, that's how I can see you. So we ask that you, thank you for joining us. Please turn your camera on and then wave your hand like Jim just did. And then I'll know to unmute your uh, audio and then you can ask your question. So everybody in attendance, thank you for joining us. Chris Reichdahl has been kind enough to make 45 minutes for us. Uh, Jim, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Whenever you're ready, go ahead uh, and ask your question, Jim. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Chris. So I'm a union rep. I work for the International Union of Operating Engineers. And I know that we have, uh, we represent a lot of bus drivers in Pierce County. And I know that the funding for the bus drivers has been cut or is looking at that. So we have a lot of, what we have is like, for example, Puyallup School District has like over 100 bus drivers. And uh, I know the schools, I know we, a lot of us um, put out a letter saying, hey, you know, can we get this changed? And I know, and I, I, I just want to make sure we understand that the real hard problem with that is, is that the, uh, you got like over 100 bus drivers at a school. And if you notice, bus driver signs are always up saying, hey, we're hiring bus drivers. So if the school districts uh, aren't funded and then they have to lay off 100 or even half that much, if they have to lay off those bus drivers and then those bus drivers get another job somewhere else, and whenever we try to open schools, we won't have the bus drivers uh, there to, we won't even have, you know, even a portion of what we need in order to get the kids to school. Um, is there any way that we can, uh, and the problem is too, whenever you, you can't just hire on a bus driver, like you can hire on like maybe a maintenance guy or something that has the experience. You, you hire somebody on new, you have to train them. They have to have a CDL and a lot of safety requirements and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not like the districts could just pick up new drivers and have them start the next day. We're talking months of training before they could even start. So if, if the districts do do layoffs and then they can't get enough bus drivers back, then what happens is there would be another couple months where they couldn't even, they couldn't even open schools. 
Um, and this is a real dilemma for the school districts and very hard on the unions and of course all the employees that want to keep their jobs. Um, is there anything we can do ab about that? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Jim. It's a really effective job laying out the dilemma here. <clears throat> um, we have a school system that is doing its best to try to deliver quality learning uh, right now. And, and of course, given the health framework for most of them, they've decided they're going to start remotely. But they're, but they're, you know, together, we are trying to get our caseloads down in counties to create an opportunity to be in person in school. And as you point out, we need transportation services when that day comes. What we have run into is this very understandable but <laughs> limiting factor where all of the definition around funding transportation points exclusively to moving students on bus routes. Um, so it's not accommodating the nature of this particular crisis where we need to move food or we need to move students maybe not directly to their school but another learning uh, center where we need to move hotspots in the neighborhoods that aren't served well by remote learning. Um, there's a lot we can do right now to enhance learning for students and support families, but the old rules don't work and we are, you know, we're stuck right now. When there are rules, I can change them, I can be flexible. We've done a ton of that to try to accommodate the needs of families and students and educators, but this one is really tight. And so we're working with the governor's office and the legislators, uh, the budget writers, meeting again with them tomorrow, really trying to figure out if there's emergency powers at the governor's office we can utilize or a real indication from the legislature that we can continue to support transportation services. It's not that we can't get the money out. We've done that, we've already approved it. It's that districts are really nervous that it'll be clawed back later because they've used it to try to accommodate this unique moment even though they aren't necessarily moving all the students that they normally do. So I do think we can get to resolution on this. Um, I've been losing a lot of hair in the last six months. <laughs> uh, this one is the latest one causing a lot, a lot of difficulty because we're trying to do it as quickly as we can, but boy, there's complicated law. And uh, anyone who knows me knows uh, as a state agency, I never want to disrespect the constitutional role of the legislature, they write laws. And so we really need them to understand and to buy into this because um, we want to respect the fact that voters put legislators in place to change laws and to make laws. And, and I can't step on those, but I can sure invite them into offering up flexibility to us. So I think we're close to a solution, uh, but we've got to be a little more patient here because we've got to bring everyone on board. Thanks, Jim. Great question, Jim. I'm going to open it up once again. Uh, Katie, I'm coming to you next. Everybody else, Katie Steiner, thank you. Um, everybody else, please turn on your camera. Uh, this is the time to ask your questions. Uh, to ask your question, I need to see you, and then you just wave your hand like Katie Steiner just did, and that way I'll know to call on you next. So please turn on your camera uh, at this time. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. Um, Katie, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Um, yes, hi. Um, so I, our school district gave uh, parents a choice to start remotely and then do a hybrid program upon return or to just choose online for the school year um, and do it that way. Um, we did choose online for the school year because with our family that works well. Uh, I know that does not work for everybody. So what I want to ask is, um, I read somewhere that the child has to be um, up to date on all immunizations, even during the remote learning, even though they're not even going to attend the school. Is that correct? That's a really good question, Katie, and I'll follow up a little bit more. If this were normal times, the legislature has established law about immunizations. They do allow for a medical exemption or a religious exemption and there's some process to go through. Um, I suspect most school districts haven't thought a whole lot about that because they're starting remotely, um, but, but that is currently the law. So you sort of inspired me to check with our student support services team here to say, is there any accommodation here in a remote environment where it doesn't make sense uh, to have that sort of rigor on the front end of the school year here? So I'm gonna take a note and make sure that I'm following up with that. And I would love it if you would email our office with that very direct question, because then we can get straight back to you. Katie, um, one more time, are you a parent and, and where are you from? What yeah, I'm a parent you? and I'm in the South Kitsap School District. Okay, anything else that you had for Chris? Any other questions about education and your kids' education? Uh, no, not this time. If you would just put... <laughs> In the chat box, if you could put the email address that you'd like me to direct the question to, um, that'd be great. 
Yeah, we will, Katie, um, with the OSPI, if you could put that in the chat box, we'll, we'll put that there. Thank you for your question and taking part. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh oh, Matt, you're muted. Sorry, um, one more time. If you uh, have a question for Chris, please turn your camera on. Wave your hand like this. Thank you for keeping me honest, Chris. I'm trying to keep the attention on, uh, on you and the parents. And so uh, that's how I'll know to, uh, to unmute your uh, microphone and then you can ask your question. So once again, thank you for being a part of the conversation. We appreciate Chris Raichtal, Superintendent of Public Instruction of the State of Washington for making time. Once again, just raise your hand just like this and then I'll go ahead and call on you. Please turn your camera on. The only way I know you have a question is if you turn your camera on. So please turn your camera on and then just go ahead and, and raise raise your hand like this. Morgan uh, Morgan D, I know earlier you had, we had chatted. Did you have a question for Chris? No, Katie actually just went down the same line that we were, I was think, um, thinking about. I work with, with uh, I'm a family advocate for early learning, ECAP and Head Start, and Katie is one of my coworkers too. And as a parent, that was a question that had come up. Got it. Um, you, I know, uh, Chris, that there were a lot of questions, um, not only about early learning, but about special education. Um, and can you speak to the parents who have kids in special ed? I have a child who is nonverbal, he lives with intellectual and physical disabilities. Parents who are typically used to getting these services in school have not been able to get those at the end of the school year in the spring. Chris, what can you say to those parents who are concerned about their kids just not getting the services that their kids need to develop? Yeah, it's really that very personal relationship between a family um, uh, and the school district and their IEP team, if that's a scenario that families find themselves in, is kind of needing to look at that IEP, affirming that services are provided, uh, where families believe that the requirements of the IEP and the supports they need can't be done remotely effectively, and you're a district that's starting that way. Um, it's really important that you engage the school district now to say, hey, I don't think the IEP that we've agreed to and built together is going to be accommodated effectively remotely. I would point out that the, you know, one of the things the governor insisted on is that unlike the spring where our buildings were physically closed to in-person learning, um, they are available to districts. Again, given the health protocols, most districts are making a really good and healthy choice uh, to start fully remote. Um, but most districts we observe are following our guidance and they are trying to make connectivity for families but they're making a decision on a couple of things. If a family really cannot connect remotely because of either a hardware issue or a connectivity issue, or a student with a disability can't really be accommodated effectively remotely, or maybe an English language learner, they are trying to figure out strategies uh, to bring those students into in-person services. Again, uh, very huge and, and, and necessary safety protocols around that, uh, but you're seeing a lot of districts figuring that out on a case-by-case -case basis. So really wanna encourage families to dive into their IEP. Um, right now, most school districts are in a planning phase and their staff will be returning soon, if not already. Uh, and we just really, really want folks to stay focused on those supports that they need. Uh, but you're down to a now a school district relationship because the policy, uh, the opportunity for more intensive supports is now there and it wasn't in the spring. It was a full shutdown in the spring, a little bit more opportunity now. Do you have any advice, Chris, for parents to help them navigate the system? Some belong to big school districts, some may be working parents and don't have the time or haven't had the time to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship with teachers who are writing up those IEPs. Any advice to help those parents of kids on IEPs get their kids the support they need? Yeah, I think, um, Matt, you know this, and any family who has uh, worked in the system, tried to work uh, uh, with educators, typically you have a relationship with a teacher who's kind of a driving force of that relationship. But at the beginning of a school year, you have students sometimes who don't know who their teacher is going to be yet. That hasn't been assigned, or maybe if they're middle high school, you know, that transition occurs where there's multiple teachers uh, that they're not uh, familiar with. So again, right now, I think the key is reaching out to school districts. Um, they have teams in each of the districts uh, who have a, a focus on this. 
And right now it's really about getting questions answered about what does my school opening look like? What can I expect at this point in time? Where's the district going if they haven't approved the plan already? Get a real understanding of that because it informs whether or not I think families believe that their IEP can be effectively accommodated through, through the means that the districts have chosen. So start with your district uh, and then uh, if, it, if it requires that IEP review, then get into it. Thank you for that advice. All right, I'm gonna open it back up once again, turn on your camera. I know I keep saying this, but it really helps us be able to see the people who have questions. So please turn on your camera. And if you have a question for Chris Rakedahl about your district, about what's going on, about helping you navigate what's going on, just raise your hand and give me a wave just like this. And that's how I'll know to call on you. So please turn on your camera and then I'll call on you and go ahead and unmute uh, your microphone. Anybody else out there, just go ahead and like I said, wave your hand if you have a question for Chris. Um, Erica, go, I know you asked a question before. It sounds like you have another question. Go ahead, Erica, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I just have another broad, more broad question. Um, I guess it's twofold. One, are you concerned about, um, my concern as a parent of a first grader would be all the screen time that could be required if she were to do a school online. And um, you know, all of her life I've been told screen time is bad and I should limit it. Um, and it's very hard for little ones to learn on a screen. So with that, um, I know a lot of my friends and families I've talked to are wanting to unenroll from public school and homeschool. And so what does that mean for the school budget and school funding if people don't want their kids learning on screens and they choose to um, homeschool? Great, Erica, let's take them a couple at a time here. Um, I too worry a lot about screen time. So one of the really positive things here is that our State Board of Education, who gets to define what an instructional hour is, has, has really broadened that. Um, and if you think about a regular classroom setting, uh, you recall that, uh, <laughs> for those of us who maybe it's been a little while, a teacher will often deliver a lesson, but there's a lot of independent work that goes on in a classroom. It's not a teacher standing in front of students for five or six hours a day, uh, just distributing content knowledge. Uh, they're breaking out in small groups, they're doing individual work, there's quiet reading time. There's a ho host and a variety of engagement activities that are often very much about the learner um, exploring the learning themselves. That's kind of the model that I think the State Board of Education had in mind. So I wanna be unequivocal here. The requirement from the state is not that students are in front of screens for five or six hours a day. Uh, we want every student engaged every day in learning, but the definition of an instructional hour can be face-to-face -face in person face-to-face -face on screen. It can be what we call asynchronous, right? Or uh, uh, recorded video, recorded content. Student watches it at their own time. There will be entire uh, half days and sometimes maybe even full days, depending on a schedule of a district, where students are assigned projects or learning uh, that is independent or reading that's independent. That all counts for instructional time requirements. And so there's definitely some confusion about this. Uh, but it is not the same model just simply moved online where teachers in front of students for six straight hours. We concur with you that that is not really a healthy thing and it actually doesn't replicate the way the world works in a regular classroom. There's always been independent work by students. Um, now to the question of what happens with families who want a different model. I think you pointed out earlier, maybe others, that there are districts really trying to create multiple accommodations for families uh, using their online systems uh, perhaps using hybrid models where it's safe to do so in counties. Uh, there's all kinds of innovation happening. But some families are saying, you know, I just feel more comfortable um, if I really lead a lot of this work in my own family. And that is their right to do that. And we really respect that. And we have a homeschool community in the state that's built out significantly better materials than even, say, 10 years ago. Uh, we try to offer a lot of our professional learning uh, to that community as well. What I would say is as much as you can stay connected to the school, do so because you are getting a pacing guides and you're getting an expectation for learning uh, that has a continuity to it for the year. Particularly if we return to school face to face, the student is um, kind of keeping up with their peers. When that happens, the school district retains those resources, the connection continues to happen, teachers are delivering the instruction. If a family fully leaves a school district and, and unenrolls and goes to a homeschool model, uh, the resources for that family um, are, are they, they sort of evaporate. They will not be in the system uh, one way or the other. Uh, so I would definitely encourage folks to maintain that connection and that enrollment with their district, even though they may be picking up a lot more of that load at home. 
And Chris, a quick follow up about that, because I did a story uh, on Monday about a single mother of five who was planning on homeschooling four of her children. There are some requirements that you must meet as a parent if you plan to homeschool your children, correct? You can't just pull them out and say, hey, we're going to figure this out and I'm going to I'm going to teach them in the way that I see fit, correct? Yeah, it is a parent's right to do this and there's pretty clear protocol, but it does involve sort of a formal process of unenrolling your, your child and then making clear what the uh, commitment is from the family. And each district knows this and they know how to work with those families. So um, it's because our law for, I'm guessing, decades, if not for 100 years or more, we are kind of a compulsory public education system. Our default is that students are in learning models, public, private, charter, tribal compact. The default is that if you are 5 to 18 years old, the state is supporting you in your basic education needs, uh, or you have decided to be in a private school environment. So if you go to the homeschool model, it does require sort of a declaration and a formal um, withdrawal from the district. So check in with your local district if that's an interest. I really encourage folks to stay connected to their schools. We are in this together. Uh, most of the big districts in the country are still going to go remote. Um, every state closed down this last spring. Um, we have probably one of the best protocols in terms of reopening from a health and safety standpoint, and we've trained thousands of teachers this summer uh, to be significantly better at, at remote learning. Uh, so I do think it's the best option to stay connected, but it is a right of parents if they choose otherwise. Thank you for the clarification on that. I think Morgan, you had raised your hand. Uh, you had a question. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Morgan, just unmute and go ahead. Yeah, my name is Morgan. I'm a family advocate with ECAP and Head Start. And so like thinking about this distant learning and this new model and stuff, like what I think about with children is that social emotional skills that they're gaining from being in a preschool or gaining before they're getting, getting ready to kindergarten. So those, you know, early learning skills of being able to sit next to another child and, you know, your pencil get taken away and not hitting that child. And so that's what I think about during this is the, the, the kiddos that are not getting those social emotional um, uh, skills as as well as you know the the um, you know getting ready for kindergarten and so what are what are suggestions for families that you know are going till you know December or even January before their kids are getting back into these early learning programs you know what what does you know social engagement look for kids right now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you Morgan um, our guidance, uh, to be clear, does allow these opportunities. And again, each district is making that decision, but we've got Head, uh, Head Start ECAP programs, as you know, following the six foot of distancing and face coverings and all that. And they're gonna try to retain those programs in many, many communities. Um, it's tough because, you know, means in a typical classroom, uh, you can't go 20, 25 students. You'd be probably down to 10 or 12 or something like that to, to meet the physical, yeah, you're at 10. So I just love the point you're making because again, we are in this together and we have to come together, but, but this is not the model any of us would design. Uh, what I try to share with families around the state is we can keep delivering content and we're gonna get a lot better at it. We've got schedules this year and we've got grading practices and we're assessing learning and there's just so much more that is robust this year compared to last spring, but it's not the model we would design. I would argue that while there, <clears throat> it's hard to quantify, the vast bulk of learning that happens in American schools happens between students. They hear the same content from an educator, but they explore the learning differently, they think about it differently, and then they share differently, and then they begin to learn from each other. The really obvious stuff like you know math skills and reading skills, but also the subtle stuff about behavior, about how to respond to adversity, uh, differences in diversity of opinion, our learning system is best designed when kids are together. That's, that's just where it's at. And so I think we all wanna get there. I think what you're gonna see is a lot of educators who are building that sort of social, emotional and relationship building skills, even remotely this year. They're not gonna dive into math content. They're gonna to try to build relationships with students and with each other and with some of the tools they're learning about. They can put students in smaller groups to really explore concepts and learn about each other. So again, not ideal necessary for public health and definitely better than last spring but our goal collectively should be to get kids back together learning together because it is a far superior model than any remote system that's been designed and higher ed's been doing this for decades and they've gotten better and i still wouldn't design entire programs for most kids fully remote such an important question thank you morgan i mean i think all of us parents know that so much more is learned and so much growth happens in school than just academics. So, so thank you, Morgan, for that question. All right, opening it back up once again. Uh, okay, Kalanit, I'm gonna come to you. 
everybody else who's just joined, I just, there are a bunch of people who just jumped, jumped on. Please turn on your camera. Please turn on your camera if you could. And then uh, if you have a question, just wave your hand like this. I will unmute you, call on you, and then you can ask your question of Chris, who's got uh, about 12 more minutes with us. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but Kalanit, uh, please, your name, uh, your role, parent or teacher, and, and what district you're in. Thank you, Kalanit. Hi, I'm Kalanit. Um, I am a parent. I'm in South Kitsap. Um, my overall question um, is what resources and support are there for working essential workers where up until now we've had our kids in childcare and camps um, and we did have the flex option which we're going to be very grateful for but now we're facing one of us has to quit our job so I'm just curious what do we do <laughs> what are our options support help um, to help our kids learn so I think you have identified, I think, the most gut-wrenching part about this, uh, and, and we're seeing it across the country and certainly in our, in our state and in our communities. We are trying to mount every resource to deliver learning for students, but there is no easy solution out there for child care. And I hate even calling it that because normally these would be 5 to 12-year-olds, 5 to 18-year-olds in our schools, obviously in a safe environment and learning. And right now, uh, we're able to deliver a better learning option, uh, but there are working families uh, like yours, like mine, um, who don't have a lot of easy options right now. So what we have tasked districts in our guidance is that they need to be brokers of childcare supports for families. So even if they can't afford multiple slots in their districts, and some are opening them up, however, with CBO, community-based partners, but even when they can't do that for every family, they should take the active and direct lead role in connecting families who need a child care support option with somebody in the community that provides it, whether that's a small family a provider or a larger center. Um, you are definitely seeing these relationships build very quickly in communities. Um, I think the hard part is this entire event we've gone through together in the last five or six months has, has done real significant damage to the child care network itself. There are a lot of small business providers uh, who couldn't make this a small child care providers because when parents uh, stayed home and worked from home or were directed to stay home or businesses were impacted, parents said, well, I'm not going to spend the 300, 500, 800 thousand dollars a month for child care. I'll just, I'll just have my kid at home with me. Now, as they're returning back to work, uh, that is really not an easy option for them. So we want districts in a lead role helping to broker that, but unfortunately they will not all be able to provide every child care slot. Uh, but I would challenge communities and families to work with their districts. They are identifying those community-based partners. Um, we are trying, trying with every bit of our power to get Congress to take an action here, to send more aid to the states. And the thing that I have said consistently to our entire delegation, both sides of the political aisle, is we have a child care problem through all of this and we need federal assistance for families so they get direct resources to pay for care. And if Congress did that more than anything else, I believe it would empower the learning and it would definitely allow families to go back to work and it would allow students to be in a very safe place. But child care is huge and we need partners at the federal level right now on this. Colin, it was an important question. The struggle is real. We've been covering what's going on with working parents. Um, it looks like you had a follow up. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Colin. Yeah, I was, I was just curious overall, like how, what's the difference in sending our kids for working parents, like just say them alone back to school versus childcare? Because I know neighborhood families are banding together and not social distancing anymore just mm -hmm. to help educate our kids. So yeah, we, school, I've been trying to listen to health experts on this uh, for sure, because they definitely are in the lead on this. And, and I think what's really clear from their perspective is size time and cohorting. So if you think about bringing back a traditional school, our average school building in the state uh, houses 500 children a day, 500 students a day. Varies a lot by some small elementaries to some very large high schools, but about 500. Um, and so you get exponential interactions, particularly middle and high schools um, and some elementaries where kids are obviously there in mass. So you're in, in, introducing the much higher probability of infection. And then they're often moving about because you still need to move kids around. Um, and they're unlikely to be in cohorts in those models. And so I think part of what the public health officials have said is even in early child centers, they don't want those to be large settings. Three and four kids in cohorts while still very risky um, does allow them to do contact tracing. 
if one of those families or one of those individuals ends up with a COVID case, they can very rapidly figure that out. If we have 400, 500, or even 100 or 200 kids in a school building, um, what they have told us most likely is they would have to shut down the entire facility. So we would start, we would stop, we would start, we would stop. And, and that would happen a lot because there's just so many kids. So it really is about duration of time. Very little time is possible, uh, as much as possible for the health officials, small cohorts. Um, that's what I think makes some small childcare settings possible and not the big giant congregate settings. We, we send a million kids to school every day. And um, I think what's really obvious now from Georgia and other states is even when they try to bring them back in three and 400 in their buildings, they have very significant outbreaks. Important question. All right. Once again, we have about uh, seven minutes left. Please turn on your camera if you have a question and then just raise your hand, just like Colonit did. If you, if you have a question, please turn on your question, uh, turn on your camera so we can see you. If you have a question, uh, Piper, did you have a question or Erica, did you have a question? Um, anybody else who has not asked one already? And if so, uh, Kenyert, I don't know if I'm pronounced Josie, Christian, uh, Margie, anybody else who has joined the conversation, just turn on your camera and, and wave your hand if you have a question about what's going on in the upcoming school year. If not, we'll call on somebody who's already asked a question. I see you, Morgan. I see you, Erica. Uh, anybody else, uh, if you have a question, once again, just turn on your camera and then uh, and raise your hand and we will come to you. Um, Morgan, you had a, a follow-up question. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, um, once again, my name is Morgan. Um, and so you're talking about, um, you know, the child care centers and early learning centers. Is there going to be an option for possible grants that uh, these centers can apply for to help them get back started up? Is there going to be, um, you know, is that is that in conversation? Yeah, thank you, Morgan. I think some of the early PPP stuff was definitely to try to support those smaller businesses, both um, uh, sort of community based organizations and private for profits. Um, I don't know if Congress is going to move forward with more of that. Uh, I think our state expended that pretty pretty aggressively. We really think it's a priority for our congressional delegation, again, both sides of the aisle, to deliver the next stimulus package that provides this opportunity. Um, so that wouldn't really want, run through us. Uh, I run education programming narrowly for public ed, but um, I think it's the highest priority for our state, quite frankly. These are small businesses and their child care centers and the possibility for learning. So we really achieve a lot if we do that. Most of that, I think, in the round one was already sort of expired and, and consumed, but there's got to be another round of this that would really help out a lot. We do expect some additional aid to come to schools uh, if there's another package, although it's, you know, it's not going well in Congress, as I understand. But if that happens, uh, they may also make some of the next phase of this available for that kind of work. Um, and if so, we will get it out as quickly as we possibly can. All right. Uh, anybody else? Go, like I said, just turn on uh, your camera and and wave your hand just like this. We just have a few more minutes left. And so, um, all right, Piper, uh, go ahead. I just go ahead and unmute. Unmute your camera, Piper. Whenever you're ready, Piper, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. My name's actually Carrie. The Piper is set up for my daughter's school. Um, my question is really more about what are we doing to prepare schools' mental health to return to normal or return to the class? Because right now there's a lot of teachers and staff that are just frightened and don't view themselves as essential workers and don't want to come back to in-person learning. So what, what is your office doing to help prepare for that transition back at some point? Yeah, that's a really powerful question. Uh, what we've tried to guide districts to, and again, guidance, because locals are really making this determination, um, is to build those cohorts, not just of students, um, but of educators, to be thinking really intentionally about screeners. So not just academic screeners, you know, where are kids in math or science or something, but where are they with respect to relationship building? How isolated do they feel? Um, what is their expectation uh, coming back? How confident are they? Do they feel safe? There are screening tools and we've supplied those to school districts, universal screeners that they can work on uh, with students. And they can even begin to do that right now in remote models in anticipation of returning. Uh, but I share your, I think, identification here that in many ways um, we have a bit of a collision course between how we feel and our health risk 
um, and what you know the health, public health experts tell us. Uh, and these are really hard things to reconcile because if you say to folks, there is no certainty of, of perfect health, just as in every year, sadly, we lose students. Um, we, and we do a couple every year to, to health issues. People sort of accept that as like, well, that's normal times. And with a vaccine for influenza, we minimize that and we're super careful. But there's a lot of folks today who say, unless you can guarantee that there will be no new infections of this thing, you know, we can't come back. And I really respect that. There's a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry about this because it is more deadly. At this point, it is proving to be about 10 times more deadly than influenza. So they're not wrong about that. But I think what's going to happen here is we're going to get through stage three clinical trials from several companies around the world, and we're going to get a vaccine. Um, but as we observe every year, A, it's not perfect. It doesn't always align. Um, there are families who make a choice not to get it, and that's their right. And so we're going to find ourselves at some point saying, when do we come back to school where there's enough safety and health in the psychology of all of us that it outweighs um, everything else? And right now, I, I don't think in our communities we have that. Um, without a vaccine, for sure, without universal testing, heck, we still have places where people are getting tests and waiting three to 10 days, and that does nothing for contact tracing and safety protocols. So there's a lot we have to do from the federal government all the way down to the confidence building in the state. So um, not there yet, but I think you've really made a powerful point though about the collision between the science and just the personal anxiety we all feel of being exposed to this. And Piper's mom, once again, you're a parent from what district, just for clarity? Hi, thank you. I'm a parent from Peninsula School District out here in Gig Harbor, where fortunately it seems that we've um, had fairly low numbers. Yeah, that is fortunate. Okay, we just have a couple, one minute left. Last chance for somebody who has not asked a question. Once again, turn on your camera, wave your hand like this. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough to get 45 minutes with Chris. We really appreciate his time. If there's anybody who has not asked a question yet, um, we just wave your hand like this, turn on your camera and wave your hand and I'll call on you. If not, I've got one last question for Chris. Uh, this is your last chance as we look. Uh, Jeremy, I think you just turned on. Okay, Jeremy uh, and Chris, uh, I'm gonna ask you about your time. Uh, Jeremy, I'm gonna go to you and we're gonna try to squeeze this in. Go ahead, Jeremy. Chris Matthew, thanks for taking the time with us. We appreciate it. Um, I am a parent from Peninsula School District as well. Just to follow up on that last question, um, You know, um, we all want to get back into school and have our kids, you know, attend physically in school as quickly as possible. But the way things are going, let's just be realistic. The chances are that we're going to be in this virtual model longer than we desire. Um, and we're all having to be flexible with that. I'm curious what the state is doing to monitor the districts and what success uh, and being able to teach in this virtual model looks like so that if we're finding that the district is failing in a way, shape or form that they can have some guidance and, and pivot on that um, as quickly as possible to ensure that, you know, the students um, can have effective learning and, and equal learning. If you will. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. As part of our reopening uh, requirements here, our guidance is every district is supplying to us within two weeks of their open and their reopening plan. And they've got about 23 or 24 metrics that they have to meet all the way from those physical health and safety things uh, for the staff and, and students they do bring in to their daily attendance processes, to their daily schedules for students, weekly schedules. Um, we do have you know, requirements in the state about days and hours. And while those hours are significantly more flexible in terms of how they're deployed, uh, we get to check on that. And we will have record of all of that. Uh, we clearly have record of how they spend money now as well, both their state money and their levy dollars. So we've got some things in place that uh, we've actually never had in the state, uh, which are good. Um, and we do get a chance to review that. Now, I will always put that balance that I do out there. We often see this stuff a little bit late. I think parents and students and educators will see it real time. And so that relationship with your local school and your local school board who will still be meeting through all of this and trying to guide their local community through this, that feedback has to be immediate to them. Uh, but we will certainly be looking at the data, both the attendance data, student performance data through assessment, as well as expenditure data. Uh, we get to see all of that along the way. Folks, that is all the time we have. Uh, I just say, I wanna say thank you for coming in, 
really important questions. Um, we thank Chris for making the time. Uh, he's going like gangbusters, working incredibly long hours. We reached out to his office and said, hey, parents, viewers are asking us questions. We'd like answers from the guy at the top, and that's Chris Raikdahl. Chris, before we go, uh, I know we've gone over our time, but is there anything else that you wanted to say to parents who may be listening now or later when this is online? Yeah, just to thank you. Um, when you start talking about education, which I think we all feel is sort of the cornerstone of what we do um, in, our, in our communities, it kind of sets us up for success in everything, individual success. It creates a labor market. It creates job opportunities. It underwrites our businesses. It is so foundational to what we do that I think this is as scary a time as I've ever experienced in my 47 years. And I was born and raised in this state because there isn't a certainty to it. You know, storms come and go and, and natural events come and go. Uh, this has so many unknown variables. So I would always just ask people to focus on sort of the compassion of their neighbors and their friends and their community. We are in this together. And these are moments where we have to come together to figure out solutions and be flexible because we, we truly are all in this thing right now. Um, and then still hold ourselves accountable. So though it is difficult and unknown and uncertain, what can we make progress on? And I think that's the beauty of local school boards. These folks are unsung heroes. And if you if you never thought about your local school board, maybe you don't even know who they are. These are people who run for office, um, uh, who serve their communities for little or nothing. And right now they're making some of the hardest decisions they've ever had to, and they're our neighbors. So, so stay close to your districts, really understand what they're doing and offer grace, but, but also you know, ask tough questions about what the deployment plan is here. Uh, we'll keep pushing for flexibility at the state level for local educators and communities, uh, but, but also with an expectation that we're learning uh, and a model that's better than where it was last spring. And I'm really confident of that but there's no substitute for the amazing in-person work that we would traditionally be doing. And so that's the goal. That's what we want to get back to. We control so much of this <laughs> with our physical distancing, our face coverings and our hand hygiene. It's just becoming so obvious. This is a virus of droplets and the most, the mo everything we can do to minimize those droplets being spread, we get our cases down and that opens up opportunities. So I love my state. I was born and raised here. I really, really love the way we've rallied. I've, I've tried to observe other states from my peers across the country, and I see them responding uh, quite differently. Um, I think we're trying to find that right balance between safety and health and education, and, and we'll just keep taking it one day at a time as this, as this evolves. So thanks for the opportunity, Matt. Appreciate it. Yeah, there are no easy answers. These are big questions that have lasting implications for students and families. So Chris, thank you so much for making the time. Really, I wanna commend all of the parents, staffers, uh, educators who also joined in the conversation. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, my name is Matt Lorch. I'm a news anchor and reporter at Q13 News, and this will be on our air and online in the days to come. So keep up the good work to all the parents and, and staffers and teachers who attended today. Uh, we're in your corner, and, and thanks for, for caring enough to join the conversation and being a part of it. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you once again.